talking about why I bother with the Bible. And, uh, you know, just kind of looking at the question of, you know, why, why should I even mess with the thing? And uh, so we started looking at, at that last week, and one of the things we brought up was um, that it gives us answers. Now, I read all the time. I, uh, I love libraries, and I, and I love bookstores. If you're like me, you know what I say when you say, when I say I could smell books all day long. You know what I'm talking about? When you go into a bookstore and you're like, books reside here. And not everybody is like that. Now, much to my, much my surprise, um, I, I, I could just get lost in a good fantasy or a leadership book or, man, you just leave me alone and I'll be fine. Um, I'm not a person who requires a whole lot of maintenance. You leave me in the corner with a, with a um, book and you don't even have to remember to feed and water me. I mean, I, I thrive. <laughs> I'm fine. But uh, much, to my, much to my surprise, not everybody likes to read. I know. It sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. I, I think it's nonsense. I think when somebody says that they don't like to read that they're lying. How could you not like to read? Um, and my, also much to my surprise is that there are actually people who don't know how to read. Both of those things really surprised me because I'm like, man, if I couldn't read or if I didn't have books to read, I, I think I'd fall apart. I think I would fall apart. And so this is just completely blows my mind. And that brings, brings an interesting question for a lot of people who don't read. Why bother, if I've gone, gotten by without it for so long, why bother start reading the Bible? I've gotten by with it this far without doing it. Why, why, why waste my time? I mean, if you're like me or pretty much anybody else in the world, you've got too many things to do and too little time to do it in. So why spend more of your time that you don't have to read a book why? Just why? I mean, there's plenty of books out there. Why not just go read a book that you actually want to read if you're going to you know, put forth the time and energy? And before I even look at that, I, I want to I wanna say this, you know. There are a lot of different options out there. If you're not familiar with the Bible, there's a lot of different options to wet your feet. Um, there's audio Bibles where people will read it to you. How cool is that? Um, they have some with note sections on them. If, if you like to doodle or take notes of what you, while you're reading to help you stay focused, different people work different ways. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's large print, small, small print. There's graphic novel versions of the Bible. There's different um, education levels with different Bibles. There's different age levels for different Bibles. I mean, they really have a Bible for everything. And uh, so I do want to say that. But still, that brings us to the question that I have not answered. Why bother if you've gotten by without it? And I'm going to say this, this real quick point here, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of build on for it, okay? So we looked at last week was to, so we can find answers, and we looked at the idea that you can you will either live by faith or you will live by fear, okay? But now that brings us to this week. What got you here won't take you there. You may have gotten by this long without reading the Bible. But if you want to go anywhere past where you are, you're going to have to do something that you haven't been doing. Okay, I'll give you a couple examples. Parenting. When you parent a baby, I mean, there's a certain way you have to do it. A lot of patience, um, a lot of throw up, a lot of poop. Uh, when they get to be toddlers, a lot of patience, a lot of poop, a lot of throw up. When they get to be teenagers, a lot of patience and poop and throw up. And No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> as, as your kid gets older, you have to change how you're parenting, right? You can't treat a teenager like a toddler, or at least you shouldn't. Now, sometimes we try to teach our grown adult children like they're still toddlers that need us to wipe their butts for them, but that's not a healthy development. You're supposed to let them go, so just so we're all on the same page. Uh, <laughs> but with that being said, you know, parenting, you, you have to change your parenting style. A lot of grandparents and, and actually parents have a hard time because they say, okay, well, what happens when, you, when your kids don't live with you anymore? What's my role now? I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing. And then when you get to be a grandparent, you, you, there's even more confusion. What am I supposed to be doing right now? Uh, am I, do I just kind of give the kids whatever they want so that they can act like spoiled brats? Or, you know, what's my goal as a grandparent? You know, and you see a lot of just confusion there. And so you have to change your, your, your parenting style. Another thing is inventing in stock. Did you know that businesses have natural cycles to them? 
you know, they have where they're a new business and you're like, hey, this is an upstart. It's risky, but if you, if you buy it now, you know, you might be rewarded later. And then they get to their, to their heyday, man. The, the, the business is doing great. Everybody knows the company. And then there's the inevitable death of the company. Now, you should have probably sold your stocks before they've reached the death phase. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. You don't invest in a dying company, right? You have to change your style. Another way is uh, when you mature. When you're a kid, you do certain things, and it's okay. You know, when you're a toddler, people have a little bit of, you know, it's okay if you throw a fit, not too much, or else it starts to be like, shut that kid up. But there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of grace there. But then when you're a teenager, if you throw yourself on the floor and kick your legs, people are going to say, okay, what's going on here? And if you're 30 or 40 years old and you're throwing, your, throwing down on the ground and kicking your legs, people are really going to say, what's going on here? And if you're 80 years old, I mean, goodness sakes, it's time to move on. <laughs> so you kind of get what I'm saying. With natural maturity, um, if you want greater faith, more firmness in your belief in God, you can't treat things the same way as you did before. When you are a young Christian, God gives you a lot of grace. When you're an older Christian and you're acting like a young Christian, God gives you less grace. And what I mean by that is it's not that God doesn't love you anymore, it's just that he's kind of like, okay, we've been over this now. You know, we, y y you need to let go and, and, and let me kind of take this one. So there's just a few examples your growth depends on this. Your happiness depends on it. Your contentment in life, your direction and your purpose in life, it all depends on this. What got you that here won't take you there. That's just a fact of life. You know, when you're a kid, you, you don't have to take multivitamins and watch what you eat. But if you continue to eat the junk food and drink the sodas all the time, when you're 40 or 50, you're really going to start to have a bad time. <laughs> You know, and then if you continue not exercising, you get into your 60s and 70s and things are really going downhill. Then you get into your 80s and you're like, man, I'm vegging out. If you even make it to your 80s. You know, so there's, there's this natural part of life where if you want to go forward, you have to do something that you haven't been doing. You will either find yourself in one of two ruts in your life. And I do, and I do use that word intentionally, rut. You will either be challenging yourself and growing or gratifying yourself in shrinking. You will find yourself in one of those ruts. Either you will be a person who challenges yourself and say, I can do better than I did yesterday. Or you'll be the person who's constantly gratifying yourself, doing what feels better. I don't like doing that, so I'm not going to do it. There's lots of things in life that I don't like doing that I still have to do. Sometimes in a hurry and I don't want to take a shower. I still do because I stink. But if you're going through the same struggles for the last 20 years, there's a problem. There, get, there needs to be a point when you move past it and let it go. You know what I mean? I think that's good enough. I'll just leave it off there. But, um, and you know the thing is, they've, they've done a lot of studies on, on the brain in, the, in recent years. And one thing that we continually find in, in neuroscience and that kind of stuff is that you're always training your brain Everything you do at all times is constantly training your brain. If I say today, I'm not going to work out until tomorrow, I have just trained my brain to put something off. I have put off exercise till tomorrow. Now tomorrow, I'm going to be more bent to not doing exercise, not just because I'm getting older and stiffer, but because I've trained my brain to say no and instead to seek gratification. So now I'm going to start, in other things too, start bending towards the things that are more comfortable. Did you know it's hard to eat healthy? Man, oh man. If you don't know that, it's because you're not doing it. Man, oh man. Sometimes I look at broccoli and I think, man, oh man, is this, do I have to? And then Gracie the other day makes this broccoli soup and I think, I hate broccoli soup. I hate it. And she's like, I want to try this broccoli soup. And I'm like, oh, oh. Man, way to ruin my week, because now I'm worried about it all week. Oh, I got to eat that broccoli soup later on in the week. Hooray. And then she made it, and the first broccoli soup I've ever had that I was like, hey, this is okay. Something that I don't mind broccoli being in. All right. Put this, put this recipe in the keeper section, because if you can get me to eat broccoli 
happily, let's plow forward. I mean, there's some, there's some vegetables I don't mind, you know, carrots, hey, that's fine. But, uh, okay, so we're always training our, training our brains, which brings me to point two of wh why, why read the Bible. Read the Bible to have comfort, to have comfort. Now, it's not comfortable when you first start because you have to give up your time. You have to give up your attention of worrying about all the nonsense that you like to worry about instead and instead focus on God's words. Like, God, I, I don't have time to, to read the Bible because I got a lot of stuff to worry about, God. God. That's a joke. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there's a few things that we recognize. I'm going I'm to point out three specific things with, with the Bible giving you comfort. Number one, the Bible doesn't dismiss the Bible doesn't dismiss your problems or your struggles. If we read in Matthew 6.34, for instance, there's lots of other places, but this is just a good one-stop shopping, okay? I like to go to the mall because it's got everything there crammed together. Uh, and do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. He didn't say there are no troubles. He didn't say just ignore your problems and hope that they go away. He said you do have problems. It's enough to deal with the problems that you have today. Why invent problems for tomorrow? So anyways, so the Bible doesn't dismiss your problems. In fact, the Bible oftentimes brings up a lot of problems that doesn't give us clear answers for now, if you're like me and you like everything to be perfect and to fit into your little bubble, the Bible is a very aggravating book. For instance, Israel's genocide of Canaan. Have you ever read that where they go and just start killing people and it ever kind of bothered your conscience? Eternal punishment. Have you ever stopped and wondered? Eternal punishment. That doesn't sound fun. Have you ever just stopped and thought about how, how terrible it is for people who go there? Sometimes we stop and say, well, I'm not going there, so it's not my problem. Well, hold the, hold the phone. There's a lot of people who are. Maybe we should be a little bit more concerned about this. And the Bible doesn't, doesn't skip around these hard issues. It doesn't just deny it like, well, I'm afraid to tell you. What's, it just tells us. These are hard things to do with. There's a part in Genesis where it's talking about the flood, and it says that God was sorry he created people. That's a hard thing to read. We see evil and suffering in the world, and we have to look at that, and we say, why did God do that? And here's the scary thing about the Bible. There's no easy answer. And sometimes the answer is hard to understand when it is given. If the Bible, if God wanted us to have these easy answers, he would have given us an answer book. He wouldn't have given us the Bible. The Bible doesn't give us easy answers. It gives us these different books, and, and they kind of talk about stuff, but it's something that you can't just read and say, okay, I have all the answers. You have to sit there, and you have to think about what's being said. What? See what I mean? It's not like, a, it's not like um, Grisham. It's not like you're reading a Grisham. You know what I mean? Or whoever it is you like reading, um, Decker or whoever. It's not like you're reading just your easy fiction. You know, you're, eating, you're reading something that requires a lot of mental effort. You know, you read in the book of Job where it sounds like, it sounds like Satan has manipulated God into being mean to somebody who didn't, see it, who didn't even deserve it to come on them. You're like, what's going on here? And then so you wade through this whole book, and you have these three friends that keep bothering this guy, and they just won't shut up, and they keep irritating him. And then at the very end of the book, you hear God start attacking the guy, and you're like, geez, God, back off. I mean, you think he's had a hard enough time. And then at the end of the book, God tells this guy who's had all these bad things happen to pray for the guys who were, who were tormenting him. God, are you serious? Weren't you reading the book that I just read? And then at the very end it says, and, and, you know, oh, by the way, you know, God blessed him and, and, and validated him. Oh, so why did we do that? Why didn't we just, I don't know, avoid that whole problem and just not have it happen? See what I mean? And you're left with this problem of why did God let it happen? And it doesn't say. It doesn't say God's intention in that. The Bible is not a book of easy answers. It's a book that lets us wrestle as much as we wrestle with ourselves. 
we are left a- asking these questions. How should I feel about these things? And then we start stepping a, f- a step further and say, well, what did the Israelites think about these things? Were they scared to do these things? Did, were they, did they feel remorse? Were they happy to do it? What was going on in their heads? And then you reach this next stage of, so what do I do with these, with these stories? You know, you've got philo- philosophical dilemmas in the Bible. You've got theological d- dilemmas, ethical dilemmas. You've got all kinds of things. And the scary thing above all of this is that God allows us to struggle with them and even gives us a record of them. I'm not like that. I think of it like this. If there's something that's hard to understand, I'd rather work it out very methodically and uh, give all the answers and then move on to the next problem to solve. But God didn't do that. He, he lets us struggle with these things. That's hard. Do you ever read something in the Bible that you don't like? If you don't read the Bible, then you, no, you don't. But if you have ever read the Bible, you're going to find something that is really hard to deal with. And you're going to find that as you wrestle with it, that the Bible is big enough. You're going to find that as you wrestle with it, the Bible is big enough. At first, you go to the Bible with this idea of, this book's got problems. It's like a teenager, man. It needs to get his crap together. And, and then the more you read it, the, and you start thinking about these things and letting it bother you, and then you hear God just kind of talking to your heart. And these, these insurmountable issues, it's not, that, it's not that they're no longer issues or that you have complete understanding, but you just start changing the way you think. So the Bible doesn't dismiss the problems and the struggles. It doesn't dismiss your problems or struggles either. Next, the second thing I want to mention, I don't have it on there. Um, So I will read it from my thing instead. We think we need immediate answers. And the perfectionist in us says that we have to do it a certain way. But aside from those immediate answers, God sometimes has us wait for an answer. Did you know that? Did you know that sometimes God will not give you an answer right away? Which brings me to this. But the Bible lets us wrestle. It lets us wrestle with God. It lets us wrestle with our reasoning. See, I'm insecure. And when people, when people argue with me, I think, oh, 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 I need to put you in your place. And yet God doesn't do that. God, the creator of the universe, doesn't. The Bible is is a thinking book. (laughs) It lets us wrestle with God and our reasoning. And through the process, we learn to wait on God. And then gradually, (laughs) then gradually we learn. And then the third thing I want to mention here We think something along the lines of this. God can't take my mess. I, I can't take my messiness to God. I can't let him see my messiness. And the Bible can't handle my messiness. Somehow I'm worse than other people or better than other people. And so we kind of live in this lake trying to shelter ourselves from the problem. And in the Bible, we see the exact opposite. We see that that's exactly how we encounter God. Is through the mess. See, the Bible speaks to us in the mess. When you don't have all the answers, when you're when you're when you're struggling in your life, when you're struggling with God, you you don't understand what's going on. God, how could you be good and let this terrible situation happen? It's in those moments that the Bible speaks to us the strongest. So we think if we have doubts, if we have questions, we have to run from God because our question or our misunderstanding or our there's an, a contradiction in the Bible, so we think, that that's going to somehow topple a book that has existed for 3,400 years or a religion that has, has existed for 2,000 years. Trust me, God is big enough for the question. Don't expect him to, come to, to, to be cool with you, you know, lipping off to him all the time. I mean, there, there needs to be a certain, remember, fear of approaching God the ultimate when you are not the ultimate. And he's not accountable to you, of course. 
Um, and a lot, but a lot of times, don't be surprised if he doesn't give you an answer right away. The Bible speaks to us in the mess. God, we encounter God through the mess. So then that brings us to a really big problem. Do I take it to God or do I take it to others? We always have this problem. Do I take it to God or do I take it to others? Because this is what our reasoning tells us. I need to vent or else I'm just going to blow up. And this is what the Bible tells us. You need to take it to God or you're going to blow up. So as an example of all these things that I'm talking about, we're going to look at Psalm 55. And we're going to read the whole psalm. Okay, I know that that sounds like a lot. I think there's like 20 verses or something. I mean, whoa. So you're going to have to really buckle in, guys. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan. I'm talking, God, and you're not talking back. I'm just kind of talking to myself here, God. Because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far, far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. Have you ever been there? I'm just going to run away from my problems and screw it all, right? Destroy, you know, at the end of Gone with the Wind where he says, frankly, I don't care. You know, that's exactly what we're seeing here. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst, oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, We used to take sweet counsel. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. We went to church together. We worshiped together. And then in this absolute pit of despair, verse 15, let death still over them. Let them go down to Sheol, which is the, the grave, alive, for evil is in their dwelling place. Smite them down and in their heart. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from of old, because they do not change and do not fear God, they'll never change. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn. Yet they were drawn swords. And then we have this faint glimmer of hope after wading through all that crap. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O oh God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out their, half their days. But I, I will trust you. There's all these things that I don't understand. But I trust you. I think that the Bible still speaks today. Don't you? If you couldn't relate to that, you've never lived outside in the world. What we see in the Bible is we see a God who's, who's big enough for the big questions. And we see a book that's big enough for those big questions. Don't worry about your mess. Don't worry about your messiness. God's big enough, and the Bible's big enough. And in the Bible, we find comfort, comfort that you will not find by gossiping about the situation. You will not find it by venting. 
you will find it in the Word of God, the Bible. You will. Now, I know that on the outset, it seems like, but it's such a hard book to understand. I told you there's different, there's different, age, different translations for different ages and for different educations. You can find a Bible you can understand. But the Bible has too much wisdom to pass up. It speaks too much to the things that you go through to ignore it. So why read the Bible? For comfort. You need it. It's something you need. It's like broccoli. You might not like it all the time, but you need it all the time. Broccoli. God, deliver me from broccoli. So let's look at a few things. Okay, verse 6, And I say, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away. I want to run away. Then you get to verses 9 through 11. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Depression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. Did you know what happens? Do you know what happens when you get betrayed by somebody or somebody hurts you? It causes you to be paranoid. You see it everywhere. When somebody does you wrong, you see it on every face. When somebody betrays you, you suspect every friend. And you no longer welcome people like you used to. I see violence and strife in the city. Everybody's doing wrong. Wait, I'm sorry, what are we talking about? Well, this guy did, this guy hurt, this guy hurt me. Okay, so let's stay on point here, buddy. We're talking about that guy, right? But what happens when you've been hurt? You see it everywhere. The, the marketplace is full of it. You know, everybody's doing what's wrong. Well, why do you say that? The very next verse, for it is not an enemy who taunts me. When you get betrayed, when you get hurt, you see it everywhere. And when you don't take it to God, it really starts to fester into bitterness. And you become someone who is not good to be around. So then you get to verses 13 and 14 here. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar, familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. We're talking about a very personal betrayal here. Then we get to verse 15. Let death tell over them. <sighs> and there's the bitterness. And you see throughout the rest of this psalm a constant struggle with bitterness versus trusting and hoping in God. And you, let me clue you in here. That will always be the struggle for you you will always be torn between bitterness and trusting and hoping in God. It, it's just always going to be like that. And in the Bible, we find a little bit of encouragement to keep on going with that. How does the Bible comfort, it, comfort us? It comforts by allowing us to struggle. It comforts by acknowledging our hurt. But it also gives guidance with these things. It gives guidance with what to do in the middle of your hurt and betrayal. The first thing we want to do when we're betrayed is we want to say, God, why did you let this happen? Rather than, God, I trust you in this. What did we see with the psalm? I think he's hurt. What would you say? I, I'm pretty sure that's an open wound there. Nobody's, nobody's blind to that, unless you just weren't reading the same thing I was reading. But he keeps going back to trusting and hoping in God and smite my enemy and trust and hope in God and destroy them. And Have you ever been in a, in a little bit of a dilemma like that? Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay. If you had, you're a liar. So the Bible gives guidance with these things. And here's another thing the Bible does. It changes what we think about. Sometimes we will be distraught because of what we're focused on. I mean, for instance, take the coronavirus. Statistically, it's not that big of a deal. But we've made it a big deal, and all of our focus and attention is on it, so now it is a big deal because it's a big deal to us. You see what I'm saying? So we have blown something out of proportion. So what can we do to fix that? Well, there's a book that I know called the Bible, and it changes what we think about. Rather than being, going to bed in, 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 in sweats, and being in constant fear and worry all the time, when you read the Bible, it gives you comfort by changing what you're thinking about. 
And the more you read the Bible, when these, when these things come up, you know, this person was elected, it's the end of the world. This virus is, it's an epidemic. When all these things come up to try and, and shake you, you're not as shaken. It's not that you're blind to the world and you're ignoring the problem. It's that the Bible changes your focus. The, 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 the little things like death, I mean, don't really seem like that big of a deal anymore in, in light with God and his goodness. See what I mean? But if you don't read the Bible, you're always going to be afraid of death. Always. It's going to be a, something that haunts you all the time. Every time you watch the news, you'll get all worked up and, 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 and go into cold sweats. If you want to live like that, I mean, that's your decision, but the Bible has comfort for us. It would be kind of foolish to ignore it. Another way that the Bible gives, gives us comfort is by giving us wisdom and life advice. Hey, you, uh, you, you shouldn't do that. Just a bad idea. Just thought I should let you know. Oh, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and ignore that. Then we go ahead and do it anyways, and we say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. Well, the Bible, it doesn't tell us I told you so. It says, hey, by the way, this is what you should do. The choice is up to you, but this is what you should do. How else does the Bible comfort us? Well, it comforts us by giving us words from God himself. Not everything in the Bible is a word from God himself. Well, let me clarify what I mean. Did you know it records Satan speaking? Okay, so we know that God didn't speak through Satan, right? <laughs> Satan's a liar and God's not, right? Okay, so you get what I'm saying. Or like where it says, then this person said this. Well, we know that that's not the word of God. That's the word of that person, right? Now I'm saying the Bible, the whole thing was inspired by God, all of it. But only the parts that said, thus saith the Lord, was the part that God saith. <laughs> so they we're all clear on that. But with that being said, you know, it actually records things that God himself said. I, th I think that that's, that's probably something that we ought to be interested in. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong there, but I really don't think I am. Uh, it reveals lies from the enemy is another thing. Do, do you know how many times the world threatens to, to really make us insecure? You're not good looking enough. You're not happy enough. If you buy this, you'll be happier. If you look like this, you'll be happier. If you do this, people will like you. We see that all over. It's on the news. It's on the ads and the commercials. It's on, it's on the shows we watch everywhere. You're not pretty enough. You're not good enough. You know, you have to be like this person to be successful. You have to be like the Kardashians. Oh, dear Lord. You have to be like this or like this or like this. Yeah. <laughs> and in the Bible, we, say, we, we see a completely different image. One of the best things you can do as a teenager to build up your security is to read the Bible. Because we find that we are made in the image of God. That's a, that's a big deal. There's a lot of people who think that the whole world depends on them. They're just like the ultimate in awesomeness. And uh, the Bible puts us in our place for those who are prideful. But it also lifts us up for those who are just wrecked. See what I mean? The Bible has something literally for everybody. And here's the thing. You would think that if you read it so much that eventually you'll run out of things like you won't learn anything anymore. But the exact opposite is true. The Bible is like, um, kind of like the universe. You, when you start reading it, you're on the face of the earth, and you're like, okay, well, I, you know, there's only, it's only going to go on for so long. But then you depart the earth, and you're traveling through space, and you're like, man, this thing just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And the more you read it, the more it has to say. And the more it has to say, the more the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and show you things you didn't know even in stories that you become very familiar with or in books of the Bible that you become very familiar with. So just throwing that out there. Um, somehow it always speaks when I need it. There's every single time that I'm, that I'm in a situation, every single time, I'll read somewhere in the Bible and I just have something perfect to say to that situation. I don't know how, but it's like it reads my mind. In uh, verse 22, it says, cast your burden on the Lord. He will get you through this. He'll get you through the questions. You can either live in despair or live in faith. But if you live in faith, he'll, he'll get you through. You don't, have to, you, don't, you don't have to be constantly concerned and worried about the things on the news. You don't have to go to pieces every single time that somebody says something mean. You don't have to always get in these fights and arguments with people who... Well, you don't have to get in con constant fights and arguments. So let's wrap a few things up. 
Chris Songson once said, life is a series of trades. And that's in incredibly important to remember. Basically, the idea is this. You trade something for something else, and you're doing it all the time. You're doing it right now. You traded something to be here at church. Maybe it was TV time. Maybe it was sleep. Maybe it was work. You traded something to be here, right? Then when you, when you go to sleep tonight, you're going to trade something else for that, right? You could either stay up and work, for instance, or stay up and read a book, or you could go to sleep. You're, you're, it, everything in life is, all, is a constant series of trades. So what you have to do if you want more of God and you want to change and you want to be different, you want to, you want to have peace, you want, you want to grow as a person, you want to know what to do in the situations, you have to trade. A lot of times you're going to trade sleep or TV time or crying over their problem for time in God's Word. See, a lot of times we think that we just got to get alone every once in a while and cry to ourselves and tell ourselves how bad we have it off. Well, instead of spending that hour a week, go to the Bible and read, read the Bible for an hour, and you'll actually feel better. The thing about constantly patting yourself on the back and telling, you, telling yourself about how you're a victim to everybody else is you're going to constantly need more and more validation. And eventually you're just going to be miserable because you'll never be able to validate yourself enough to make yourself feel better. You'll always be telling yourself that you're the victim, that everybody has wronged you, and you'll never get past it. You'll never get past it. You'll be, you'll, you will be literally fighting the same war your entire life. You can live like that, but I'm telling you, it's not a good way to live. And another thing that Chris said was, you have to learn what you haven't before and unlearn what you have. There are some things that you've learned in your life that are wrong that you need to unlearn. We have learned to maybe gossip, to maybe... Um, live with our problem instead of just moving past it. We have learned to not read the Bible. We have learned to get into our own little time and just, you know, I, God doesn't speak to me through the Bible because I'm not reading the Bible, so I just kind of, I'm spiritual enough to kind of do my way through. Or, you know, I, I it, actually, you see a lot of college kids do this, and Pastor and I were actually just talking about this last week. You, you get to where you read so many books that you actually forget to read the Bible, and so all your knowledge about God is coming second or third or fourth hand from other people writing books of their encounters with God or of their encounters with encounters with God. And you get, you get way down the list, and then you're reading a book about a guy who's writing about a missionary who's telling you a story about a pastor who's telling you about... See what I mean? And it's just like you get so disconnected from the story. God wants to actually speak to you now in your life and do something in your life now today. And in the Bible, he will. It's not the only way that he'll do it, but the Bible is a big way that he'll do it. You have to grow past your old schedules. You have to grow past how you, how you are used to spending your time, how you are used to spending your money, and move on and grow. There's much fear and worry. <laughs> and a lot of the times our fear and worry is because of the things that we've traded. We've traded our money for things that we don't want so we can impress other people rather than trading our time to get with God. And so we're more miserable now. We're, we have greater fear, greater worry, because we're living for the approval of other people rather than for the approval of God. A lot of the time, if you are afraid and worried all the time, a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, it's because of the things you are trading. You're making little trades in your life for comfortable things rather than making little trades in your life for things that are hard but necessary. Reading the Bible is hard, but necessary. Hard, but necessary. Read the Bible because you need comfort that comes from hearing from God. When you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and shows you what you didn't see. Shows you what you didn't know. If you want your life, your family, your community to be better, you must learn to pursue God. And the Bible is one way that you pursue God. People will follow your example. When bad situations like corona come by and everybody's freaking out and you're not, they're going to they're going to wonder why. You're going to have more wisdom in the things that you say. 
you actually are going to have wisdom to give because you're drawing from a source. What's the source? The Bible, God. God is giving us wisdom in the Bible. Well, when we read it, we become familiar with that, and we learn a better way of doing things. And so then when people start talking to us, we'll have better things to say rather than just whatever garbage. Because a lot of times what we say to people is garbage. And I mean garbage. And we're going too long, so I'm going to stop with this. We can't restore people to God and hope if we keep God at a distance. If you're living in, and I do want to, and I do want to mention this, if you are living in fear because of corona or because of something else, you don't have to. You can have peace. The Bible can give you comfort if you only read it. It's that simple. There's no magical incantation. You don't have to pray a special prayer. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be a licensed pastor. You don't have to have, be a respectable person. The Bible speaks today. And it has something for us today. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing in our lives and in, in, in the world today, God. We know that you're always on the move. We know that you're always in control. And we know that there's never a moment when you lose control. Lord, I pray that you would put in us a hunger and a thirst to read your word. And that as we read, we would understand it. Lord, and as we read, you would give us these answers, give us these comforts that, that we've been talking about, God. Help us to stay in your word and to stay hungry for more. Lord, we love you. Amen.